Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the second week of the winter session of the virtual NYI. Um, and to our general lecture series, this, I believe, is lecture number seven. Um, or, yes, lecture number seven in the series. And um, we, uh, before I introduce the speakers for today, I would like to encourage everyone to keep their cameras on. Uh, just for the for uh, the benefit of the speakers, so they can see their audience. Um, you don't have to, but it's a nice thing to do. Um, and um, we will have uh, discussion and questions, I believe, at the end of the talk today. Uh, the talk is being recorded and streamed on Facebook. Uh, so just for full disclosure. Um, and I am delighted to introduce. Uh, Amelia Glazier and Saul Noam Zarit, uh, who are giving a joint talk today. Um, and it is particularly nice because Amelia is someone who has taught with the live St. Petersburg NYI uh, in person twice in the past, I believe in 2009 uh, and 2011. And also this summer at the virtual, the first virtual NYI program. Um, and Saul is new for our program. So we have a continuity, you know, moving from continuing people to new people, which is always nice. Um, and, but this is a joint talk of theirs. And, uh, and let me introduce both of them. Let me start with Saul because if newcomer, welcome to, to the NYI project. Saul Noam Zarid is an associate professor of Yiddish literature at Harvard. Uh, he's in two departments, the Department of Comparative Literature and the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Um, in 2020, so just last year, his, uh, his book came out, Jewish American Writing and World Literature, Maybe to Millions, Maybe to Nobody, uh, with Oxford University Press. Uh, he's also a founding editor of in Geveb, uh, Open Access Digital Journal of Yiddish Studies. Um, and his PhD is in Jewish literature from the Jewish Theological Seminary, is that right, in New York? Um, and uh, so welcome, Saul, it's great to have you. Amelia Glazier is Associate Professor of Russian and Comparative Literature at the University of California in San Diego. She currently directs the Jewish Studies, Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies programs. Um, her most recent book is Harvard University Press, Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine. It was published in November 2020. So these are very recent works and Saul is showing us Amelia's book. Um, there it is, it's great. Um, she's also the author of Jews and Ukrainians in Russia's Literary Borderlands um, in 2012. Um, and uh, when both of them, of course, have written many other things as well. And also a 2020 book uh, co-authored with Stephen Lee, who's with us today, welcome Stephen, um, Commentaren Aesthetics in, in 2020. Um, and Stephen will be giving a talk on Wednesday and the two talks, today's talk and Wednesday's talk are somewhat related because they're on the similar themes um, that have to do with Russian, Soviet and uh, international issues of, of um, ethnic and uh, international writing. I don't know how to characterize their connections, but I'm sure you guys will do that for us. And I also want to say one more thing about Amelia. Um, Amelia was a participant in a program that, that I directed a million years ago uh, in where, we, where high, um, college graduates came to St. Petersburg and taught English in high schools. And uh, that was before she uh, even went to graduate school, correct? Um, and it was sort of her first, her first venture into teaching and now she's a, you know, an international superstar. So I feel some personal connection to Amelia's uh, development since um, she came to St. Petersburg on that program, which was called Petro Teach, um, which also produced Andrew Kramer, the New York Times Moscow correspondent who you may read a lot of these days. But in any event, let's, um, so the talk today is called Jewish Literature and Social Politics in the US and USSR Recent Reappraisals. Please uh, do our usual tradition of turning on your microphones now um, so we can give an actual clap of welcome to um, Saul Zarit and Amelia Glazier. <laughs> 
was lovely. I've never had that one happen to me before. Oops, sorry, not that screen, not that, not that share screen. Which one do I want? This one. Okay, um, it's really great to be here. Thanks uh, for having us and being having being part of your program. It's very exciting uh, sounding, and I hope uh, this is one of many great talks. I'm sure. Um, it's also great to be here to uh, share our work with everyone, but also I'm excited to be uh, here sharing my work with Amelia. Our books share a lot in, in many ways. Um, and a lot of the way they overlap is, is trying to think about how Jewish writers and Yiddish writers in particular conceive of the world and their roles in, within that world. Um, our, our books present different ways of understanding the intersection of Yiddish and Yiddish culture with uh, something that I might call institutions of world literature, or institutions of literature, institutions and networks of literature. Meaning, what does it mean to write in a Jewish vernacular while also writing towards larger universal transnational or even uh, to use a fancy lingo, uh, planetary structures. So how does a writer's indebtedness or embeddedness within a kind of Jewish language inform their ability to reach across linguistic, cultural, and political boundaries. Um, for some, this means, uh, for some writers that we talk about this, it means a kind of aspiring towards ultimate translatability, uh, tr trying to find ways to go back and forth between different languages almost seamlessly, um, also using different political vocabularies in different languages simultaneously, and striving for a kind of solidarity beyond one's particularity. Now, for other writers that we might talk about, the opposite impulse uh, is something they take on. So something like a retreat away from these external and sometimes threatening structures back to defending one's mother tongue, or like one writer said, back to the ghetto, a desire to go back into the ghetto. And amazingly, some writers, in fact, maybe most of the writers, do both of these movements simultaneously. And that's one of the things that we try to struggle with, that kind of simultaneity. Um, of course, all of this becomes much more complicated in that our writers are living in a rather uh, difficult time in the 1930s and beyond, con con you know, contending with pogroms, purges, assimilation and language loss, and of course, uh, the Holocaust. Um, here's a nice picture of our books. Um, I think they've got great covers. I just wanted to say that before we get too far into anything. Um, so this, is, this kind of convergence, I think, is a, a place where we might begin uh, thinking about the multi-pronged responses of this convergence between, convergence between Jewishness and the world. But before we get too far in, I do want to at least start uh, with a little bit of an introduction about what Yiddish is, so that we're all on the same page. Um, just a brief word about uh, this 1,000-year-old history. I'll just show you an image of the first, um, uh, the, one of the first images of Yiddish literature that we have is sort of notes within a, uh, a machzer, within a, um, within a Jewish liturgical book, some sort of instructions about who should bring the book uh, to the synagogue. So just a, a quick image of that. Um, but uh, Yiddish is a Germanic language uh, formed, as, formed by Jews living in German lands, uh, a fusion language between the local Ger German that they would have spoken and the languages they, they brought with them all along their migrations. So some Romance languages, but, but most importantly, Hebrew and Aramaic. So it's a fusion language that has a Germanic base, but has lots of Jewish vocabularies in it. And then as these communities moved eastward, as these arrows helpfully point out, uh, Yiddish changed again into having many more Slavic language components that be, be they grammatical or semantic. Um, and of course, Eastern Europe is where Yiddish found it, a great home and where it bloomed uh, as a language, but also in terms of the Jewish population living in those regions, such that estimates say that by the 1930s, there were some 11 million Yiddish speakers. Now, of course, these Yiddish speakers did not remain in uh, Eastern Europe, but of course, uh, migrated throughout the world, uh, especially in the 19th century uh, following anti-Semitic uh, violence, but also the sort of collapse of the feudal economy in Eastern Europe in the late 19th century. So uh, going to Western Europe, Palestine, South America, North America, and of course, beyond. Um, and with this migration, Yiddish underwent rapid modernization, became a language of a modern culture, a language of labor organizing, of, of mass urban culture, of newspapers, popular fiction, theater, um, 
and of course, one of the languages of Jewish modernism, so a high, high culture as well. And it's only later in its decline uh, that it became um, what we know of today as that funny immigrant language, a sort of a Bubby's language. And we're not gonna get into that sort of postmodern or post vernacular version of Yiddish, but know that it is hovering uh, after many of the things we'll be talking about today. Um, so what we wanna talk about today is a particular slice of that moment. Um, and if we think about it sort of in terms of geographically, following the Bolshevik revolution, there were several centers for Yiddish and North America and the Soviet Union uh, were really two of the most dominant versions of it. Um, and I, our work, I would say, begins from trying to understand how these centers of Yiddish production, how they interacted both with each other, sort of across the Atlantic, and with and against the different inst cultural institutions that determined um, their ability to function. So I think one of the challenges that comes with this work is trying to keep in mind the multidirectionality of it. I'm using a term here by um, Michael Rothberg. So there, there's a ten tendency, I think, among many scholars to read in one particular direction, use a kind of national model. That is, um, just like other cultures and languages were going under modernization, so was Yiddish, and its cultural products belong in some way as to the Jewish people, sort of like assets the Jewish people has as it joins this world republic of letters. Um, and Yiddish and the Jewish people, so the rhetoric goes, has a particular place in this world republic. It's informed by some Jew Judeo-Christian tradition after all, but still a kind of marginal position. But one of the things I think I try to do in my work is to think about trying to upend this kind of marginalization. And one of the ways to think about that is what does it mean to write modern literature in general? So to write towards the modern is already in some sense to, ab to abandon one's national origin or at least partially undermine it, right? To write modern literature, even if you're writing in a Jewish vernacular, even if your writing is never gonna be translated, you're already trying to approximate different vocabularies that you've inherited from a seemingly foreign source. You're already writing towards a convergence rather than writing towards a particular community. Um, this means that one way one is already losing one's Jewishness the minute one speaks in a modern uh, um, um, idiom. At the same time, you remain beholden to your Jewish vernacular, to your vernacular one way or another. Uh, you're beholden to your Jewish vocabularies because you never enter blankly into the institution of world literature. There's always something stamped on your passport. Say. Um, and this is what leads to something that I call, um, following Derrida, of course, a kind of undecidability. So when a Yiddish writer is talking to the world or taking pen to the paper and trying to talk to the world, who or what exactly are they writing for? And I wanna give a, a brief example here um, in talking about Isaac Besheva Singer, perhaps one of the most famous uh, Yiddish writers uh, born in Poland, but moved to America won the Nobel Prize um, in 1978. So I, I presumably he's made it on the world stage, right? You could say he's done pretty well for himself. Um, and when he was asked in 1963, so before he became too famous, who exactly, what kind of audience he thought of when he was writing, this, this was his answer. I'll just sort of skip to the bottom. Um, a writer should not think about who, he's going, who is going to read him because the moment he thinks about this, some other power interferes. In my case, writing Yiddish and thinking about the readers would really destroy the writer completely. But happily, I never think about such things. When I sit down to write, I have a feeling that I'm talking maybe to millions or maybe to nobody. Um, so this is 1963, 30 years after he moved from Poland, 20 years after the destruction of Eastern European Jewish life and decades um, into the linguistic assimilation of American Jews. So you can understand him being kind of scared uh, to mention his actual readers um, because they're in such deep decline. But he of course quickly shifts perspective to this idea of writing kind of a vague idea of writing maybe to millions and maybe to nobody. So what exactly could this mean? The nobody uh, could reference someone, this kind of despair that we associate with the Yiddish writer toiling away from nobody at all. But this also has a romantic quality to it, something about the lonely genius, you know, uh, working just for the sake of the art of it all. 
Um, he also this way kind of frees himself from actually having any accountability to his readers because there there's there's no readers. He doesn't have to. He has total control over whatever whatever process might come with his work. And on the other side of that, nobody is, of course, the millions, the potential, of the millions, the, the, the wonders that translation might be able to provide him. And of course, he did find this kind of success. It became a household name among Jewish and non-Jewish readers in the US and across the world. So the millions and the idea of world literature in this sense promises a rise out of one's vernacular obscurity into this universality. Uh, this is the promise of world literature, the ever expanding possibility of global circulation. Still, the amazing thing about this quote for me is that everything that's here, both the romantic and the universal and the global are contained within this concept of maybe. His writing is, is in a kind of limbo. It maybe will get to either of things, but maybe not, right? Um, there's a kind of instability that is fundamental to the way Isaac Bush a singer thinks about his own work. Did he belong within a Yiddish literature spread thin across the global diaspora of Yiddish speakers? Did he belong in a new category of Jewish American writers, a collection of immigrant and post-immigrant writers? Um, should his ambitions be larger to just transcend this all and write towards everybody all at once? Um, and arriving in this kind of republic or palace of world literature. And Bashevis doesn't really give an answer to these questions, I think. And that's part of the, the compelling nature of his writing is it's a vacillation between all of these audiences or all these goals at once. And that, that really, that uncertainty is the focus of my book, trying to think about how Bashevis and other writers like Sholomash, Yankov Gladstein, Malatovsky, Kadyu Malatovsky, Saul Bellow, Grace Paley, and others think about this kind of institutional um, confusion. Um, and I try to sort of figure out how they measure themselves against um, both the demands to write beyond their local, uh, their local spaces and what exactly that local vernacular demands of them as well and how they try to deal with the fantasy of legibility and, uh, and the actual commitment to one's uh, um, sort of local ghetto. And what I try to do is sort of read all the failures that come about in this moment, their failure to live up to the fantasy and their failure to really feel very comfortable around all these ghosts, these vernacular ghosts that um, haunt their, their, their writing. So that's sort of my take on my work and how it fits in there. So now I'll pass it over to Amelia um, and I'll, uh, should I keep sharing? I should, yes, okay. Yeah, if you don't mind continuing to share from the, um, the, the slides, that would be awesome because um, I've got all mine in there now. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much again, John, for having us and, and thinking through this uh, this series, uh, talking first with John and then with Saul. The idea was to discuss ways that past cultural interactions between, especially between the US and the Soviet Union, helped to highlight interactions between world literature and social justice and even things like translations. So um, an added plug for Wednesday when my colleague, Professor Stephen Lee will, uh, will continue this by thinking about how the Soviet Union figures into conceptualizations of, of world literature on Wednesday. Um, so one thing that both Saul and my books do is attempt to talk about a literature that is still really minor, considered minor on, on a large scale, right? It's this language Yiddish that is, um, you know, it's the language of, a, it, it's one language of the Jewish people. It's not a language that is taught in, uh, in ordinary public schools in any part of the world. Um, but how do you think about Yiddish literature, this very specific thing as a means of thinking about larger trends in world literature? How does Yiddish offer a case study in those interactions? And, um, and my book is really a salvage literary history. I brought in a lot of poems that, um, that nobody had really read. Uh, well, some of them were better known than others, um, but the poems that I researched for the books are, uh, for the book are by, by poets who chose to align themselves in a very polarizing time with the far left. Um, so for, uh, all of the poets in my book align themselves at some point with the nascent Soviet Union. Some of them would leave earlier, some of them would leave later. But this was for them a way of making sense of injustice and inequality that they, that they saw around them. And their literature, their Yiddish literature was itself a kind of world literature in and of itself. Um, so if, um, you know, Saul has talked about 
upending the idea of marginalization and what did modern mean and um, the writers that Saul's examining, the Yiddish writers that Saul's examining are really sort of struggling between uh, the need to be translated and the, and the need to just, you know, remain really, really good and important in and of themselves. Um, for me, I'm looking at poets that kind of took for granted that their own community was enough. <laughs> it was worth writing just for these Yiddish speakers. And they knew exactly who they were writing for. They did think about their audience, unlike Bashevis, who was sort of higher than that. And um, they didn't believe in Judaism. They weren't religious, but they did believe in bringing the world, bringing a kind of world of literature and a world of struggles into Yiddish. So I'm going to uh, to go ahead and offer some examples. And in the book, I'm I'm interested in how poets developed and and merged a vocabulary of collective Jewish identity with a poetics of communist internationalism. And I argue in the book that they did so by by applying Jewish terms, very specifically Jewish terms or passwords as I call them, terms that were specific to Jewish practice and Jewish collective memory. And they applied these to the, the contemporaneous struggles of non-Jewish minorities, non-Jewish ethnic minorities. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start with one example by Hey Levick that you see in front of you or H Levick in, in English. This is, a, uh, this is a poem dedicated to Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, two Italian anarchists who were put to death in 1927 in Massachusetts on uh, charges of murder that were never, um, never uh, fully proven. And um, I, I'll go ahead and just read this, this short excerpt from the poem to you. Uh, maybe I'll read it in English and in Yiddish just to give you a little bit of a taste of the Yiddish in your ear. Some of you who may speak other Germanic languages in addition to English, uh, will recognize some of the words. Um, and those of you who speak Hebrew will also recognize some of the words. Uh, Today, like last year, the hangman's feet dance the Charleston the world over. Fuller's bite hasn't even been covered with a scab. Uh, Fuller was the, uh, the judge. The same evil from accuser to accuser, the same fist, the same power. Oh, we won't forget how the clock hands dripped with blood that August night. Heint a zoi wie fahre joven, Charlestonen, über der Erd, dem Taliensfies. Sis noch a viele nicht verzeugen geworden, mit kein Heitel der fullerischer Bies. Du selbe Schlecht von Kateger zu Kateger, der selbe Feust, die selbe Macht, o mir vergessen nicht, die Weisers von Säger, wie sie haben getrieft mit Blut in Euges Nacht. It's just a, a tiny excerpt. Um, what Levick does with this poem is he uses this concept of, um, of the kateger, right? He talks about the same evil from accuser to accuser, or in Yiddish, from kategel to kategel, uh, to discuss this, this sort of generalized evil that is out to get the oppressed of the world. Uh, he's localizing the term kategel, which in Yiddish had come to mean prosecuting angel taken from a Talmudic term for just prosecutor um, or prosecuting attorney even. Uh, so this was taken from Jewish tradition, a very specific Jewish tradition, already kind of, it had already mutated from, uh, from Jewish law, from the prosecutor to Jewish folklore where the Kateger had become kind of a, an accusing angel. Um, so Levick took this term and applied it to the sentencing and execution of these Italian anarchists, not Jewish, but like Levick, they were immigrants to the United States and they were vulnerable to a system that um, you know, was constantly pushing immigrants and, um, and other others down. So what we see Levick doing here is taking essentially a Jewish password, this, this word kategor that you would know if you knew Jewish folklore, if you knew Jewish law, if you'd studied in yeshiva and, and using it to bring these Italians into the fold. Um, I'm gonna just give a couple of other quick examples so that you, you see what I've been seeing as I've gone through these poems, which is the use of these very specific Jewish terms or terms that had become well-known, even images that had become well-known to talk about uh, suffering other than Jewish suffering. So the next example I'll give, Saul, if you don't mind advancing to the, uh, the Markish poem. 
Um, this is a very long poem, so I've just taken a, a tiny excerpt from it. Peretz Markish, a Soviet Yiddish writer, wrote this poem in 1936 about the Spanish Civil War. And actually it was translated into a bunch of languages. It was translated into Russian and to some other Soviet languages because it really kind of was one of the first Spanish Civil War poems uh, to come out in the Soviet Union. But he opens the poem, I'm again your guest. The honor makes me sad. I haven't kept the oath. The ancient ban hasn't been lifted. In your cemeteries of the blasphemed by the fence are still piled mounds of ash from my past of old. Um, so Peretz Marcus here is talking about the Spanish Civil War, the, uh, you know, the, the struggle of the Spanish Republicans against the, uh, the rebels who uh, had staged a coup and were overthrowing the left-wing government. And he's comparing that to the Inquisition, which is a, you know, unique tragedy to Jewish memory. And he's even bringing into that memory, that collective memory of the, of the, the Jewish memory of Inquisition and expulsion from Spain, this, um, this image of mounds of ash from, uh, from his own past that are piled up. And, and Marcus in his, in his poetry about the Spanish Civil War kind of places the war on a historical continuum of Jewish suffering. So mounds of, of ash from my past are piled in these cemeteries next to these new bodies. Um, but, but for Markish, the war is a modern inquisition. It's one that's targeted communists as well as Jews and heretics from the inquisition. And by opening his poem with this past memory of violence, Markish is employing an established password, this concept of the inquisition to, and he, he later actually gets to this, to, uses the term the Inquisition, uh, to evoke what, what Maurice Halbox had calls, has called external or social memories, as well as the more internal or personal memories of his own experience. Markish had fought in uh, the, uh, the Civil War, in the Russian Civil War. He had written about, he, in his most famous poem uh, from 1920 and, uh, 1921 called The Mound or Die Kuppe was actually about piles of Jewish bodies left in a, in a mound after, uh, after a pogrom. So he's bringing together the recent Jewish experience of a pogrom with the Spanish Civil War and with this distant memory of the past and even using his own earlier pogrom poem as a kind of password for bringing in the Spanish Civil War. So this is another way that Jewish poets in the 1930s specifically were starting to move from a conversation about Jewish suffering to a conversation about the suffering of workers of the world, specifically oppressed workers of the world in other places. Uh, and it was a, I see this as a moment when Jewish modernism was moving from a, you know, a conversation about, about pain, which it had to be, right? It couldn't be anything else in the midst of pogroms. Um, and, and translating, really translating that experience of pogroms for a Jewish audience, not for anybody else, but for a Jewish audience, um, to try to invoke a sense of empathy with others, with other groups. Um, just one more quick example that I'll bring in, and that's uh, Esther Schumacher. Schumacher was, uh, was born in Eastern Europe and emigrated as a child to Canada, but uh, Later, as a um, as a young woman, as a you know, in her early twenties, she uh, she married an uber famous Yiddish writer, Paris Hirschbein, and the two of them traveled all over the world. She traveled especially to East Asia and um, and the Middle East, and then the two of them landed in the Soviet Union in 1928, where Esther Schumacher started to write about her travels or kind of finished writing about her travels, and Schumacher as well invokes this idea of mounds, um, really really referencing Peretz Markish's earlier pogrom poetry, as well as other pogrom poems that use mounds of, mounds of bodies, uh, especially the, um, the very famous poem by Chaim Nachman Bialik in the City of Slaughter, which was a Hebrew language poem that also discussed mounds of bodies. And she brings these mounds to, uh, to the border of China and India. And in this poem, she writes about um, she writes about these these piles of bodies that she's seeing in her travels to East Asia. Um, I'll just read this uh, quickly in English: "Lives swarm on a pile of trash. Whistle me a song in the wind, in the void. Homeless hands find a home in the gutter. 
hunger has ruined a crumb of a body. Here on the trash heap, the sorrow has grown. Somebody's life is bound to expire. Whoever has sinned against these hands, he has plucked and dishonored this life. And this is taken a little bit out of context, but she's writing specifically about women, about impoverished women that she's seeing on her, uh, her travels, um, mostly in, she's spending most of her time in China at this point, but also crossing over a little bit into India. And so she's bringing that, um, that suffering body from Jewish pogrom poems into uh, what she's seeing around the world. Um, so the mound had become this quintessential motif for suffering, and here it's being localized to other groups. What I noticed when I was doing all the research for this book was that in the heat of this very polarizing moment, the 1930s, this large group of idealistic young Jewish poets were focusing their writing in the, in the USSR and in the United States on other national groups. And the question that I had to ask was why were they doing this? Part of this came from a, a direct <laughs> mandate from the Communist International. These were poets that were turning themselves to face Moscow, and the Communist International was saying, this is, this is the time to be thinking about other groups suffering, not one's own suffering. But I think that there's a, a more complicated answer to it as well. Many of these writers were writing in places like Canada and the United States, Mexico, where there was no official censor that told them what they had to write about or not write about. And what they were actually trying to do was redefine the binary, the binary of us versus them. Uh, they, were, um, they were using Jewish terms and applying it to non-Jewish groups. So that instead of talking about us as us Jews, which had been the tradition to that point, to the mod up to the modern moment, they were starting to use us to talk about we workers of the world. So they would use terms like katega or terms like, you know, the, the pile or the mound, terms like no pasaran, or even names like Angelo Herndon or places like Scottsboro uh, to bring their poetry into a different idiom and to, to, to kind of uh, world their poetry within the Yiddish language. So I think one really interesting point of intersection between my project and Saul's project is the way that this very specific kind of literature, Jewish literature, interacted with an idea of world literature. And I think that this idea differed depending on which poet you would ask. Uh, the poets that I'm talking about were internationalist in the communist sense. Some of them left the party as early as 1929, others stayed with it until the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939, others stayed with it for the rest of their lives until the 1960s, including writers that had, um, you know, long immigrated to the United States. But whether the writers were based in the Soviet Union or the United States, the center for, for their project was Moscow. And they viewed Yiddish as a tool for world liberation. So as such, their poetry um, written in Yiddish was a way of translating an internationalist spirit, a deeply secularizing spirit into Yiddish for a Jewish audience. Um, so I think, I don't know, this is probably a good spot for me to stop and we can maybe uh, get into some questions for one another and then we'll toss some more questions out to uh, uh, allow the audience to toss some questions in. Yeah, I, I wanna start actually with, um, because of that last example, I wanted to know more about why the pogrom, especially nowadays, because we're talking about, there's a lot of controversy around comparison and the possibility of comparison between, and we're talking a lot about new forms of fascism or repeats of Germany in the 1930s, whatever that's big in the news. And a lot of this involves using certain terms. Yeah. So these days in the news, it's the concentration camp, or I'm thinking about in terms of Jewish studies in the fields, fields we're in, talking about a ghetto, talking about the diaspora are very loaded terms. Yet for these writers to say pogrom, it was just sort of like, it's all over the, the, poem, the poems that you bring and, and throughout the book, this idea that pogrom was the instant like moment for cross-cultural solidarity. Um, I'm thinking though that some of these terms go the opposite direction. So for a writer like mine um, in one of my books, he's not my writer, one of the writers I talk about in my book, uh, Jankov Glatstein, he really seizes on the idea of ghetto, not as a place of, of, of solidarity, the opposite of place of retreat. He opposes world to ghetto. Whereas nowadays we know ghetto is in, in the United States com, you know, context, 
filled with different kinds of racial uh, and racialized and and uh, different kinds of terrible meanings in the U.S. But in any case, or pro productive ones uh, as well. So the question I had is sort of why why the program or why does violence why is violence the first place of solidarity or suffering the first place of solidarity? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, first of all, I think violence, in, and I'd be really interested to know your your thoughts on this too. But my my feeling is that Yiddish modernism came out of violence. That you have, you know, some of the most important Yiddish and, and Jewish modernism, really, not just Yiddish, because you have Bialik writing in Hebrew, and um, and you, uh, you know, you also have have arguably some, you know, Russian language modernism that's that's also really writing about this this violence against Jews. Uh, it's, um, you know, the modernist moment, the tens and the twenties was a moment when people were exploring their own language and their own experience uh, across languages and, and Jews were doing this too. And what I see happening in the 1930s, starting with let's say 1927, I, I, I sort of use 1927 as my starting point. That's the year of the, um, the, the, uh, the third uh, period really takes off in Soviet politics, but it's also the year of Sakon Vansetti in the US, which was a really polarizing moment. Um, so starting around 1927, the, the formal poetry remains kind of the same, but they're, they're writing about different things. They're applying these motifs of violence to other groups. So it's a moment when everybody's starting to, to open out. And I think it's precisely the sacredness of that suffering that, um, uh, that makes it worth applying to these other groups. You know, we, 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 uh, for the immigrants to the United States, we see lynchings, we see how horrible it is. It is so horrible that here we, we are going to identify the victims of these lynchings as the Jews of this country. <laughs> you know, we see suffering masses along the Yangtze in China and you know, we recognize that these are like Jews. <laughs> these are these people are suffering what we have suffered. We see what the um, you know Spanish Republicans are suffering in after 1936. So it's this um, almost a gift, right? A gift of their own suffering to the outside. Except that they're not giving it to the outside. They're writing it entirely for a Jewish audience because these mostly were not translated. An exception is of course Markish's poetry that was translated into Russian but it was really um, telling Jewish readers, it's time to start to reconsider who is ours. Can we start to think about these others? Yeah. That, that's where I wanted to like push a little bit more because it's a question of ownership, right? Uh -huh. So what does it mean to sort of, on the one hand, you're giving over like a gift, like you said, like you also can have Jewish suffering, but it's yeah. also naming someone else's suffering as Jewish uh -huh. and sort of claiming it at the same time. Yeah. That, that's what that's what's so confusing to me. And inscribing their own suffering into a sort of world canon of suffering. <laughs> right. This isn't this is yeah. right. This isn't a black body suffering. This is my body suffering in some sense. Mm. I got, you know, that kind of transgressive mode of translation that is also a kind of ownership, right? When we translate something into another language, you're also claiming it in some way. Well, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to ask you a similar question about this impulse to view one's literature as worldly. And you write about this, especially in the case of Sholem Ash and Isaac Besheva Singer. These are writers who become superstars. You know, my, my grandmother read Sholem, he didn't speak any Yiddish, he read Sholem Ash in English. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very easy to get Sholem Ash's books in English because they're all bestsellers and everyone gave them away afterwards. Everybody gave them away, right? But this was like back in the day. And um, yeah, so what, where does suffering fit into that? Right. And, and that process of becoming universal, of becoming a writer in English, even even as these writers are continuing to write in Yiddish. So Shalom Ash is actually um, quite similar to the communists in that way, despite his being an arch nationalist <laughs> and kind of a reactionary. Um, he deeply this is a writer um, who wanted to win the Nobel Prize. Um, he wrote big, giant um, novels that were meant to be approximations of the European novel. Of, of Tolstoyan novel. He wrote novels that were kind of middle brow and not exactly the highest of art. They're meant to attract audiences and be ready for translation in some way. And he really believed in internationalism, just not one that was named as communism, 
one that for him was deeply religious in nature, though he himself was secular. I know that's kind of complicated to put it, but he deeply believed in Judeo-Christian civilization. He deeply believed in the West as a construct that needed to be um, urgently um, defended in some way in the face of fascism. Um, he thought that his books could save the world and they were meant to do that. So he wrote um, this novel that I write about called um, The Psalms Jew or called and translated into English as a book of salvation. It's about this, uh, the sort of education of a young Jewish tzaddik or a Jewish saint of some kind. Um, and how he goes from being an obscure shtetl figure into someone who might be able to bring about the redemption of the world. And that's sort of how Ash thought of himself. Um, so sort of um, the opposite direction, if um, for, for, your, for, your, for the writers in your book, they're trying to import and name, and name something as Jewish for the Jewish community, for the Yiddish speaking community, Ash wanted to prove that Jewishness was at the center of the way the world should work. The Jewish vocabularies were that, were that which were going to save the world. Later on, he goes on to write a novel that's based on the life of Jesus that basically portrays Jesus as being a Jewish, uh, you know, good Jewish liberal of some kind. Um, it, so it's sort of a very strange kind of opposite I direction. I through that book in graduate school. <laughs> And the, just the code to that, amazingly, that novel, so he wrote that novel and got into a lot of trouble because he was writing about Jesus. He wrote this Jesus novel like in the 1940s, which wasn't exactly the right thing to do in the 1940s to write a novel about Jesus in Yiddish for a Jewish audience. And so he used to write for the forward, which was the big socialist, but uh, sort of um, center left socialist newspaper. And they hated it so much, they kicked him off the staff. And he went somewhere to find a way to publish his next Christological novels. He did, uh, he did Jesus, he did Mary, and he did Paul, novels of the life of Paul in Yiddish, and then translated into English. And the only place that would uh, publish him was the was the Fre was the Freiheit was the Morgan Freiheit. So even though he was a Zionist and a nationalist, somehow during the 1940s he was allowed to be a communist based on sort of an alignment of this internationalist goals in some way. And that's a really interesting, I mean, that that helps to fill out the picture of communist internationalism that at least in its American iteration, it was actually quite accepting, right? This was, you know, the aspirations to be a center for world literature were strong enough that there were ideologically opposed people that were allowed to kind of publish there. Um, and the Freiheit really did publish some fantastic literature, it published some really bad literature too, but it published a lot. And, um, and you, you know, you you could pick that up and find some really interesting writing, uh, which you couldn't do with the forwards at that point. Um, I, I want to, yeah. Yeah, I want to follow up with a different question because um, I'm thinking of another figure in your book, uh, the writer Moisha Nader, who has uh, uses the passcode he uses is uh, tshuva, which in, in sort of a Jewish vocabulary in Hebrew comes from the idea of, the word literally means return, but it means a kind of, going back to religion, being born again, to use a kind of Christian vocabulary, but a kind of return to the fold. And, um, and you talk about his, the two moments of return or confession of sorts or, 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 or a re repentance of sorts that he does once when he returns to the communist fold and at the end of his life, he returns to Judaism um, and away from communism. So how do, you, um, how do you explain the kind of failure of that password in some sense? because it was a password that indicated a kind of joining with solidarity with an, a communist international, but he used the same password to reject that same movement. Yeah, yeah, so the, and that's the, the, the chapter, as you know, that, that ends the book. Um, there's, uh, you know, this, this concept of doing tshuva was used a lot. The password for tshuva was actually used for this confessional mode. Um, people talk about it a lot in, in, in Russian literature, right? That people are making this, um, this doing the samakritika, right? The self-criticism. And tshuva was the term used in Yiddish for that. Uh, and in fact, there were a lot of ironically used uh, very Jewish terms among the Yiddish communists. Um, he doesn't use the term. He's not saying I'm doing mm. tshuva. Uh, 
he just does it. <laughs> and then other people, the critics identified what he was doing as chuva. And they said, but this is his second chuva, or maybe it's even his third, I've lost count, right? <laughs> First he was a bourgeois and then he became a communist and he had to do chuva and now he has to do chuva again. Like what, how many chuvas are we going to accept? And I think Lama Shapiro actually has a quote about him where he says, he writes this in like an obit obituary, I think, where he says, Moisha Nadir, you know, Moisha Nadir did chuva so many times that we can't accept it anymore. Um, something to that effect. And Nadir died of a heart attack prematurely, um, you know, in, uh, in 1943. Uh, and he really had sort of started doing tshuva around 1939. So he, he didn't have that long as a penitent. He, uh, he left the party. Um, he was never officially a member, but he, he moved himself away from the party with the Hitler-Stalin pact, which is what, you know, several people did at that time. Um, but what was interesting about Nadir is that he started to write these poems to God. And that's a really, I mean, that's a kind of interesting move. It's, a, it's maybe a little similar to Glatshane, uh, except that Glatshane is just saying, I'm kind of slamming the door on the outside, but he has some other, some kind of religious motifs in there too. It's not that these writers were becoming religious. I mean, they weren't going to become, fundamentally, they were not religious people, but they were thinking about the value in tradition. And he was bringing, you know, Nadir, he wasn't going to start going to synagogue, but he was going to start bringing prayer back into his writing. That was for him, that was, that was tshuva. And um, almost everybody did that to some extent, even the people that didn't leave the party, even the most like flag waving Stalinists at a certain point after the Holocaust started to write poems in memory of the Jewish people who had died. So was, there was this return of some form. I don't, I don't think there was any way of avoiding it. I mean, you have um, Aaron Quartz who wrote a happy birthday poem to Stalin in 1949 in Long Island, right? Like there was no reason he had to do this. He was really a, as they say in Yiddish, a fabrenta, right? He was, he was a real believer. Um, even Kurtz is writing these Holocaust poems. And, you know, he's, he writes, uh, you know, poems using more and more kind of Jewish prayer terminology after the 1940s. Uh, so kind of everybody's doing that to some extent. They're, they're turning back inward. Um, yeah, I, um, so that's a, that's a quick answer to your question. Um, yeah, yeah I just I, I'm interested because one of the things we were trying to figure out here is what the are there limits to solidarity, or are all the sort of like the expiration date on the passwords say this is a sort of crude way of putting it? Um, can those expiration dates be renewed in some way? Because one of the things I think is fascinating about your book, or one of the things I'm aiming to do in my book, is to think about comparison and translation more capaciously. Right, so if, if these writers sort of hit a limit, I can't translate that anymore. I'm, I have to go into the, I have to go back into the Jewish, I have to go back to a Jewish vocabulary meant for a Jewish, um, a, a Jewish mode. Is there a way, at least, at least I like to think of our work as trying to bring back the possibility of comparison. Meaning though they failed in some sense or hit a certain limit, the duty of the scholarship of our scholarship in some sense is to reenact the possibility of comparison. Mm -hmm. um, that while these writers didn't necessarily see themselves as participating in the world or in America or, or able to participate in, in this internationalism anymore, our goal as scholars should be to restore, in some sense, their place with it, not, not within these hierarchies, because I don't think that's going to be helpful, but in order to tell the story of American literature, for instance, or to demonstrate its instability, these are the voices that we need to talk about. Or if we want to really talk about um, Soviet literature, to talk about them without these figures that struggled with the very terms of what Soviet might mean would be essential for telling that story. In some sense, we're sort of restoring the past words, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that part of that is it's there for us, right? It's that, you know, that it's, it's saying, and that's the maybe to millions, right? <laughs> um, uh, you know, to once you start to imagine possible future scholars. I That it kind of segues well into a question that I wanted to ask you, which is, um, you're writing a about some writers that care deeply about being translated, being legible in a universal scale and others who, who didn't, who resisted that. Does that align to your mind as a scholar with actual translatability at this point? Uh, translatability for whom? For us, for us, oh, as for we us. bring them, right? As you teach them. Do uh, I recommend that you read Shalamash in other words? Well, do you think that, um, you know, a glotch stain 
is more translatable to some extent than a shomash in the long run, right? Like, like you know, right. so the real God, God's is, saying the obscure modernist. Uh, yeah, Ash, what actually, who, yeah, yeah, what who actually contributes to that hall of uh, of world literature? Is it is it the one who retreats into the into the ghetto, or is it the one that tries to write for Christians and maybe you know contemplates even converting to Christianity because it's all the same and we should be legible to the universe and so forth? I, my official answer is that it's unfair to choose. <laughs> I should say it was much it was much more fun for me to write the Gladstein chapter than it was to write the Ash one, like that, that kind of, you know, um, assimilatability um, has its pitfalls. Yet at the same time, there is a kind of tendency towards this very narrow thinking that you can find in Gladstein and that approaches a certain kind of chauvinism and very, and almost reproduces a kind of violent nationalism at the same time. So um, one of the things that Gladstein flirted with was this idea of a deferred world literature, right? that eventually world literature would discover me, but not yet. Um, and so that's, that's another thing that I think is worth contending with here. Instead of trying to impose and promote a particular kind of canon of world literature or demand that these writers or those writers be restored to some kind of canonicity, um, that instead we understand that that for all of these writers there's a kind of um, instability to it or vacillation or a kind of again uh, this term I used before a multi-directionality to it that we don't need to place them one place or another or demand that glass chain be read over and above Ash but sort of understand their approaches kind of mirror one another rather than cancel one another out if that makes sense. Yeah yeah, it makes me think a little bit about what you're, you had said earlier. Early in your book, you talk about Gladstein and the, the world literature to come. So mm. uh, you know, if we're the world literature to come, right, how it's does this, it Yeah, it's the next international, the next common turn, but yeah. not this one, if that makes sense. Um, I, let's, John, let's open, yeah, let's yeah. open it to questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just, this is, this is great to have a discussion between the two of you. I really love this format, something that we haven't actually well, done okay. before. It's a, no, it's a fantastic format. Um, and uh, uh, there may be some questions from the audience. And we do have a question from a Facebook viewer. I wrote it in the chat there. I don't know if you see that. Um, you, one of you could read it and um, do what you like with it. Um, but we, it would be great to let the Facebook uh, comments also be heard, and then ask see if other people in the audience here have have anything for you. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, so I'll, I'll go ahead and read this. Um, recognizing one's own experience of suffering as an arch that can bring closer to the otherwise um, inaccessible suffering of the other, is it not a certain vision of solidarity? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I, I always remember when I think about teaching something like Yiddish literature or even Russian literature in America, um, I think about something that uh, the late Amos Oz said when he was visiting UC San Diego several years ago, which was, um, you know, I wrote a tale of love and darkness because it was the most specific individual story of my own childhood growing up in, you know, in Jerusalem <laughs> that I could think of. And it was that book that ended up speaking to people around the world who had no experience of what I'd been through in, you know, in, in the 1940s and sort of in, in Palestine and Israel. And, uh, and I think that's a really important observation that sometimes the most particular ends up being the most universal because you're not, you're not trying to align details. Um, so it actually becomes, offers potential for solidarity it offers an invitation for other people to think about their particularism. Yeah, and, um, Derrida has like a pretty obscure term to talk about this. It's called, uh, he uses the term telepoesis, which means sort of um, imaginative making at a distance, which I think is pretty powerful, meaning that the idea behind solidarity isn't to make one's experience exactly parallel or to replace one experience with another, but that you imagine a connection without, while, while recognizing difference. Mm -hmm. Meaning difference is key to the possibility of solidarity, not, not something that needs to be erased, if that makes sense. So imagine of making, but that actually recognizes the distance between two experiences without trying to somehow homogenize them or synthesize them within some kind of multicultural uh, horizon of meaning or something. 
So yeah, any questions that people have? Uh, how I don't know how we're running the questions. Yeah, go ahead and just you know you can. Use sure, anyone who could just yeah. <laughs> um, raise their hand or shout it out or write it in the box or um, whatever whatever works. I, I, I could ask a, a question, uh, but thank you so much for this conversation. Um, and I found myself wondering about, because you, you talked about various ways in which we could, we could bridge these different, uh, different worlds of, of, of uh, lit Yiddish letters, um, thinking about suffering, for instance, and different versions of internationalism. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, if we could use literary form to, to do well. And I, I, you know, I, I think typically when we think about kind of Soviet oriented literature, we think about, yeah, poems to Stalin, maybe a kind of realist or socialist realist aesthetic. Um, and especially during the Cold War, yeah, there was a kind of uh, assumption that, that, that we could sort of think about uh, literature as a clash between, between sort of Soviet oriented realism and, and a kind of Western oriented modernism. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if the, the writers that you're studying um, help us to think across that, that divide. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Marcus um, and his sort of uh, his recourse to like always return to futurism, even if he was writing in a more accepted kind of poet, poetic mode. That's one thing I'm thinking of for in terms of the Soviet examples. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Amelia, but um, yeah, no, it's hard because of the way I'm thinking of of how international or global modernism works as a thing that has such a, a broad set of forms to it, especially in poetry, that it sort of, it fractures in so many ways that one can have a particular political affiliation and not have that necessarily line up with one's uh, aesthetic choices. Um, yeah, I'm, this is a, an active question for me right now. I'm trying to write a, an article <laughs> as we speak about um, the role of the key of modernists in um, the proletarian literature of the 1930s. And the proletarian writers from the US and from the Soviet Union kind of didn't know what to do with these modernists. There had been an explosion of modernism in Kiev uh, in a group called the Kultura Liga around the time of the revolution. And then, you know, many of them were written off as overly aesthetic or overly, you know, uh, taken with Hebrew or, you know, they all had different reasons. They were sort of marginal. Many of them, people like Markish did manage to come, come back. Um, but the proletarian didn't know what to do with these guys because it was never totally clear whether they were kosher by Soviet standards. Um, and um, it wasn't so much a pull between realism in their case and modernism as much as a pull between uh, sort of those who had been born late enough that they came of age writing about factories mm -hmm. and those that had written about national suffering. Um, but you do have, I mean, you do have, have even some of the earlier modernists that try out a realist vein because that's what they're supposed to do. And as Saul's saying, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. <laughs> they keep coming back. Um, and many, you know, many of these modernists just, you know, kind of wandered into translation because that was, that was simpler. Um, but you did have writers like Dernista who kind of, you know, maybe tried to write in a realist vein, but just kept getting pulled back into this mystical modernism that was his origin. So the Yiddish writers, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, who's a good realist Yiddish writer? Maybe Sholomash. <laughs> yeah, no, but he's... In his later stuff, yeah, right? Not his early and he's also interested in, you know, a kind of um, the global novel as it's defined these days, sort of that kind of legibility. That I mean, is something I struggle with. I wanted to write uh, mostly about fiction in my book. Um, and so the writers that wanted to get the most audience or get the most readers always wrote in a kind of generic realism of, of some kinds in writing fiction. And the writer Gladstein, who was this modernist who didn't run to write for translation, tended to stick with his modernism and wrote modernist novels, but also modernist poetry. Yet at the same time, in the post-war period or already starting in the 1940s during his retreat into the ghetto, actually started writing poetry that was less and less uh, modernist or less creative. And so there was a kind of almost parallel um, in this kind of self-censorship that took place in both uh, 
both his rejection of the world and his retreat from modernism that happened at the same time. So genre, like, yeah, choosing genres is, is very fraught, um, even as it enables a kind of uh, cross-political or cross-linguistic cross, cross kind of comparison. Stephen, happy to take any other questions, or I'm happy to just dive in and ask more questions. <laughs> I also have more questions, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have. I'm actually, you know, I've been reading your book all weekend, so I have all these questions written in the margins that I'm going to want to ask. What we that. could do also is, um, if you are willing to share the slides, um, of course, and we could post them in. There's a folder for the general lectures, mm -hmm. and if there's you know, additional things that you want to comment on or, or yeah. um, bring up that, that we didn't have enough time to get to. We can kind of have post a, I don't know what format it would be, but we can post discussion or follow up comments by you or any, anyone else. So happy to do that. I, I, we also, we each had another little kind of final, final thought slide that, you know, we could maybe uh, quickly bring in. I'd love, I'd love for you, Saul, at least to mention yours. Um, okay. It's a really nice way. Okay, why don't we do that for our up. last maybe five, six yeah. minutes, because then we, we probably should let people go. Uh, yeah. You know, this yeah. Is well, this is actually, it's, it's a good one to sort of think through some of the problems we've already sort of talked about. Um, that uh, this is a quote about Glatstein from Irving Howe's book, World of Our Fathers. Yet he, Glatstein, knew too well the realities uh, knew the realities well enough, once saying with a sardonic smile to the author of this book, what does it mean to be a poet of an abandoned culture? It means they have to be aware of Auden, but Auden need never have heard of me. Um, so you could read this, I think, in one of two ways. Um, there's a kind of mourning and a self-suffering and a kind of uh, self-flagellation going on here that, you know, no one cares about us Yiddish poets. Um, we're so great. Uh, Glatchen would often say Yiddish poetry is one of the best, is, is, the, is the best of world poetry, but no one knows it. Um, yet at the same time, there's a kind of um, advantage here that, that Glatstein gets being in that way untranslated or unrecognized or not part of the world in some way. Um, he becomes the equal of Auden without, uh, without anyone having to judge him whether he's equal of Auden or not. Because it's assumed in this sentence that of course, I'm as good a poet as Auden, right? Um, there's also, if we're thinking in terms of solidarity, a sense of an equivalence, right? We both have something to say about the world. Um, we're both ready to do that work. Um, but it also gives him a sense of freedom that no one is judging him so he can do whatever he wants. He's not beholden to any institution of world literature or any institution like Soviet literature, right? There's no one demanding what genre he should or should not write in or what kind of politics he should or should not have. Um, so that's, that's why I like this quote, because it gives us a sense of, of both a sense of obligation to literature, a sense of, uh, of, of importance in the world of literature and its politics, but also a sense of understanding that we have our own vocabularies, we have our own passwords that have their own value over and above anything that some external set of, uh, of arbiters might, might have for us. So that's, yeah, that's my, I, I just, it's such a great quote. I know everyone quotes it a lot, but it's one that I think sort of encapsulates some of the paradoxes that we've been talking about today. Yeah, thank you. And I, I wanted um, to just read this question that just showed up in the chat from Rachel uh, Gordon. How do you square that uh, Gladstein or how quotation with the singer quotation with its hope for Yiddish to go global? Yeah, it's a kind, I love how they, they work together in, in an amazing way um, that, um, for Glashen, there's no maybe. Uh, he doesn't, he doesn't, he just knows already that, that he's achieved some sort of world status and not global, right? It's sort of against the global, but for the world, if that makes sense. So if global is a kind of capitalist term announcing a kind of global circulation and ability to be translated and be recognized, the world is a more ephemeral ca a category, a kind of aesthetic category, um, one that, that determines a certain kind of value. Um, rather than a kind of commercial, oh, commercial one. So that's, that's why I think uh, they work well together. That's a great point, Rachel. I know we're a little over time, so um, if we yeah. need to 
end the talk at this point. That's totally fine. I'm happy to stay in the uh, to stay in the Zoom room in case anybody wants to ask questions or feel shy in front of the whole group and wants to ask questions after the recording's done. That's fine too. That's a great, that's a great idea. Um, I think we should do that. Um, unless there's any final comments that anyone wants to make at this point. Um, so let's let's thank our speakers with with actual clapping, unmuted, unmuted clapping. It sounds like this. Remember. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a fascinating discussion. Um, people are welcome to stay. We're going to stop the recording now. Um, I think. Uh, and stop the streaming, but the discussion can always continue. Thank you, Vinny.